and then it will see. <laughs> Sweet. Yeah, so thank you for coming out, everyone. Um, it's exciting. This is our first online webinar. So yay. Um, yeah, so a few quick updates. I'm Zach. I'm the president of the Coffee Club. Jill and Kate are here. They are also eboard members, and Brandon and Christopher Crowell. We are all eboard members of Drexel Coffee Club. Um, and then this is the first installment of our little lecture series that we have this winter that we're excited for. Um, it sucks it can't be in person, but online is just as fun. So we have Gabe Boscana from Machina Coffee Roasters here to talk about coffee processing today. Um, so yeah, I don't know if Gabe, if you want to give a little introduction of yourself and then just get going. Sure. And then I don't know yeah. if you want to share your screen or anything, but. Uh, I will, I will in a few minutes, I think. Um, it just, it's way more helpful than just listening to my talking head. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm Gabe. Uh, I'm the founder and roaster and co green coffee bar for Machina Coffee Roasters. Um, we, we just opened up a roastery in Coatesville. It's a little bit out, like 20 minutes outside of Westchester. Um, and we've been in business for four years, but I've been in the specialty coffee business for almost 20 years. So basically right out of college, I got a job at Gimme Coffee in Ithaca, New York, and kind of got stuck in coffee because um, I thought it was super cool, um, both both from a like social justice perspective and also from uh, an agricultural or agronomy perspective. I thought it was super awesome. And um, let's see, uh, yeah. So so this is my first owned business, but I've worked for um, I've worked for so for Gimme Coffee as a barista for a long time. Uh, I did I did the whole gamut of barista competitions and all that that sort of funny stuff and um, uh, I was the uh, director of roasting for Intelligentsia Coffee out of Chicago so I managed all the all their three roasting plants uh, LA San Francisco and Chicago um, learned how to roast in San Francisco when I worked for Ritual Coffee Roasters I was the first um, official employee for that company and 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 got my introduction to Stumptown and like that's when really things changed for me. Uh, with specialty coffee. Um, and then I was the green buyer for Sight Glass out of San Francisco. So I was their green buyer for three years. Uh, yeah, some long, you know, very windy road, but I ended up here knowing that I wanted to, to um, not only roast, but I wanted to source my own coffee. Um, so I've done everything from, you know, barista manager, barista competitor, roaster, buyer, roaster manager i've pretty much done everything uh except grow coffee so and uh process coffee so that's that's my really really truncated background um i did i went i went to ithaca college and i i did a uh, sociology with a concentration in gender studies um so i you know really weird road to get to to coffee but it's it is actually related uh coffee is people so I don't. Do you want me to just jump in into the the processing lecture? Is that the? Yeah. Yeah. Feel free. Cool. Okay. So, um, coffee processing. So there's there's like a few. You can there's a few ways to talk about it. The way that I would like to approach it with you guys, very sort of basic and quickly, and then if you have any questions or anything like that, um, post our question uh, section. And if you want to email me personally, there's just a, there's a ton of information. I'll try to do my best. To, to make it as, as um, digestible as possible. So the way that you get your cups of coffee, let's go backwards, right? I receive it, I roast it, but the way that it gets to me is essentially, you know, coffee is a fruit. Uh, it's coffee beans are seeds. Uh, they come from a cherry-like plant or shrub. It's actually not a tree, it's a more like a shrub. Um, and there's a ton, there's like hundreds of varieties of coffee. The two main species are Arabic and Robusta. Robusta is what, you know, uh, Vietnam, India, they, they grow a lot of Robusta and that's for Maxwell House, Folgers, um, super big yields of fruit, um, low quality, low elevation, tons of caffeine. Um, so that's the Robusta, that's one branch and the other branch is Arabic and that's what you guys and what we, most people drink. All the way from a big company like Starbucks to your local coffee shop, they're serving Arabica. Um, coffee. The reason being it tastes better. It's better quality. Uh, it's sweeter. Um, the caffeine is not as intense. It's not as like weirdly jittery. Um, and the next time you, you, you feel brave enough to try like a, like a, like a Folgers and then sort of think about how you're feeling and then do it again the next thing, just do a regular like specialty coffee. The, the, the rush is different. It's just a totally different 
um, it's a species, it's a different bean. Anyway, so you, you pick the cherry uh, and inside that cherry, you're gonna see the seeds. So it's like two beans like this. Um, and you have to go through a process of, there's three major ones. Uh, it's washed, honey, and natural. What washed means is you take the cherry, you, you literally wash it, and then you deep pulp it. You take, you, re, you separate the, the fruit from the seed completely. You wash it again to make sure that the actual seed has nothing on it. No mucilage, no honey, nothing. Um, after you've washed that, you can either ferment it. Um, you can go through a process of fermentation. You either kind of put it in a, in a mound, uh, like all the, all the seeds, you put them in a mound and you wait, you know, 48, sometimes 36, 36, 48 or 72 hours. Uh, you separate them, you wash them again, and then you throw them out on the patio or on a raised drying bed to dry. And that's called a drying process. At that moment, um, they get packed up and sent to a dry mill. And what a dry mill is, is that it's going to separate the very last skin that's over the seed before it gets exported. And then we receive it as roasters. So that's washed. You wash the seed, you take everything off, you dry it, you export it. Uh, honey is sort of in between the wash process and the natural process. Honey is, you do the same thing, pick the cherry, but you don't totally strip the seed of all of the mucilage and the honey, because it is, it, it's like a honey texture from the seed. So it's half washed basically, but the same process happens. But that one is a little bit more intense and uh, if you ever see like a honey processed coffee, it's going to be more expensive because it's way more risky to do that because you're risking rotting, you're risking bacteria, you're risking mold when you leave, you know, when you leave sugar out <laughs> for a while. Um, so there's, and then with those, I think there's four stages of honey. And all that means is the amount of mucilage left on the seed when it's dried. Uh, so it's white honey, yellow honey, red honey, black. And you can sort of gather from the colors that it's the black honey is like where you, they're leaving a lot of that mucilage on the bean. Um, and typically with those coffees, they're more expensive, they're riskier, but also in, in the cup, um, they're, they're a little bit heavier, they're sweeter, they're really great as espresso. But in my experience and in all the years in coffee, weirdly enough, if you, they just don't have a long, as long of a shelf life as a washed coffee. Um, I'm not exactly sure why that is, but it means what I mean by that is that um, I can have a washed Ethiopia on the menu for like a year and it tastes amazing, but a honey, if it's the same exact coffee, but it's the honey process, it'll maybe go half that, like six months and then it starts to kind of taste old. Um, I think it has to do with some sort of um, just the chemical uh, aspect of, of leaving the mucilage on there. Okay, the third process is a natural process or is also called a dry process. And a drying process is very traditional in Ethiopia. It's traditional in places that don't have a lot of water because with uh, the, you know, with wash, you need a ton of water to get all that, all process all that coffee. And the natural uh, process is um, you, you strip the cherry from the tree, but you actually don't, I mean, you, you wash the actual cherry, but you don't, you don't depulp it. You don't take, you don't, rem, you don't separate the seed from the cherry. You wash it um, and you can remove floaters. And I'll show, there's a video that I'd like to show you from Sweet Maria's that's very, very helpful. Um, but you, uh, then you actually let the coffee dry on either the patio or in raised drying beds, but you let it dry in, in the cherry. Once it reaches a certain point of dryness of moisture, you then send it to the mill and the mill will actually separate the, um, the, the seed from the dried cherry. So it's like a raisin basically at the end of it. And then that's exported uh, to us. And that one is, um, those are also a little bit more expensive for us on our end because you're, you're risking a whole lot. You're risking rot, you're risking um, improper drying um, due to weather. Like maybe they have a really wet season that year. And, and so they're leaving it out to the elements and there's kind of nothing you can do. The, the only other way to do natural is to do uh, mechanical dryers. Um, and those aren't, those aren't as good as just open air drying. And it also typically takes a lot longer for, for the drying, um, the natural process to happen. So those are the three main methods, washed, honey, it's also called, um, it's also called pulp natural uh, or semi-washed. It's the same thing. It basically means that you're leaving some sort of mucilage on, on the seed uh, before, you, before you dry it and then export it. Um, so that process happens. So the coffee is exported, um, it's cupped first. I don't know, do you guys know about cupping at all? Okay, 
So, so there's, there's two, there's two um, reasons for cupping. One is a technical uh, reason, which is to figure out where on the, on the quality scale this coffee is. Is it a commercial quality um, or, is it, or is it specialty or is it super specialty boutique? Um, so it's not just to get flavors, it's to actually determine, okay, how are we gonna price this? And where in the market is this coffee? You know, what, what quality type is this coffee? Um, are we gonna market it as specialty? We're going to give it a score and depending on the score, <clears throat> excuse me, depending on the score is how technically they price it alongside the C market, the commodities market. Um, I don't buy coffees based on the C market really. And that means that I, I negotiate with the importer or sometimes with the actual um, producer. And we talk about, you know, what the value is because there's got to be a meeting ground and there's got to be a meeting place, right? Because my value isn't necessarily the same as the producers, but I always want to, as a, as a green buyer, I always want to be sure that I'm paying way above the C market prices um, and that I'm also paying a sustainable price to the producer so that not only are they meeting their costs because they're, they vary year to year, um, the cost of fertilizers change every year, the storms that hit Central America, it, that's going to be interesting for this coming season, what that does to pricing. Um, but also I want to make sure they're actually making a little bit of profit. It's not just a, a you know, at cost situation for them. Um, so once that's, that's set up, once, you know, I've, I've, I've decided, okay, well, I'm paying $3 a pound, let's say, which is, um, definitely way more than most people pay for coffee, which is kind of wild to think about. Um, the contracts are drawn up, um, uh, I get a date of expectation. Okay, this coffee, I've cupped a coffee, a sample of the coffee before I purchase it. This is kind of what it's going to taste like. I'm down. I want 10 bags of that coffee. I sign the contract. It's expected in May. The coffee then arrives at the warehouse or the port, usually New Jersey. I get a sample of that coffee to make sure that it's the same coffee I cupped because there have been times in other jobs where I cup the sample that they send before they ship it and then the sample that they send when it lands and it's not the same, um, which is really tricky to navigate, especially the small operator. Um, that's why importers are great. They have insurance, they can deal with it. Um, but it, when you do direct trade, which means you're really dealing directly with the producer and you're using the importer just as a logistics um, person, when those sort of debates happen, they're really, really delicate because the coffee goes from producer to the miller, who's the person that's depulping it or the person that's, um, that is separating the husk from the dried coffee to export to that miller, to the export, who's also potentially exporter and then to the importer. There's many hands that that coffee crosses and maybe if I'm producing coffee and I, I'm like, cool, I've sent it, great. My buyer's gonna get it. But at some point in the process between the producer and the roaster, something happens. It's really hard to trace that. Like, oh, this miller maybe switched the bag out or two bags. Um, so things get a little tricky with, it's important to know your producer and it's important to know your importer, it's important to know your exporter. Um, as it pertains to you as consumers, um, in terms of like what processing means and flavors, um, a washed coffee is also called a mild coffee. And what that means is it doesn't have any funky fruit notes. It doesn't have, it's a very clean, like a lot of, like the Nicaragua that I sent all of you, that's a very classic, nice, clean, washed coffee. Um, it's got some citrus, it's got some caramel, it's got, you know, um, hopefully no hints of roast, which means carbon. <laughs> um, and it means like rubbery, you know, I don't, I roast my coffees fairly light. Um, but that's your classic wash coffee. A honey coffee is going to have a little bit more body, a little bit more fruit, and then a, a natural is going to have a ton of fruit. You're going to get a lot of Concord grape, blueberry, strawberry. Um, I'm not a huge fan of naturals because it's almost too much. It's too much flavor. But um, for you guys, that's what processing means. And when you get a really good cup of coffee, just remember that it, it's gone through like at least 20 different steps and definitely, definitely like 20 different hands have somehow touched that coffee before you guys get it in your cup. So it's, it's coffee would not exist without people and, and their work. So, but I wanted to show you a video um, and I'll share my screen in a minute. It's a, I don't know, uh, there's a company called Sweet Maria's also called Coffee Shrub. 
And um, they've been around in Oakland for like almost, I think tw over 20 years. And I would say that they're one of the best, most legitimate, thoughtful resources for coffee information uh, out there. Tom Owen is the guy who owns it. And um, he started as wanting to help people at home. They wanted to be home roasters, uh, get as much information as like someone like myself gets uh, on coffee. So I'm gonna grab my, the screen here really quick and see if I can um, show you this video of it's um it's a guatemala coffee processing video but i think it it's basically what we just talked about just, just so you can see what the process looks like let me just make sure i have the right link here okay let's I'm gonna share my screen okay oh weird i cannot try to here, I just made you the code. Thank you. Oh, no. Thank you. That's what I was looking for. Awesome. Uh -huh. Thanks. Let's see if this works now. Sorry, it's taking a second here. There we go. Got it. Okay. I think we should be good. Let's try it again. There we go. Cool. All right, can you guys see that? Yeah, cool. All right, so let's. So it's only three minutes, so. Install the coffee in Guatemala is wet processed. This is what happens at small coffee mills in Guatemala. These machines are coffee pulpers, which remove the fruit skin from the seed. This belt-driven mill is at Finca Isnul in San Pedro Neta, and the other is at Finca Ro All right, so um, basically, so the, the patios that you guys saw, that's pretty typical. Um, the other way to dry the coffees are mechanical dryers. When there's, if it's a huge estate and they don't have that kind of space, because you think about you wanna, you wanna really um, thin layer so that, it, that you're able to turn it over and so it dries evenly. 
Um, so the really big estates, they, they do a little bit of patio and then they, re, they move the coffee into these huge mechanical dryers. And then mostly in Africa, it's why they're called African raised uh, beds. Uh, they, they'll do these um, very, very simple tables with like a mesh and then they put the coffees on there and then they get, um, they, they get more air circulation like from bottom all the way to the top. Um, and uh, that's the preferred method of drying. It dries it much more slowly. You want it to be nice and slow um, because it essentially it actually um, makes the coffee more stable and it makes the shelf life longer. Um, so I can have it in the warehouse for a long, longer without, without risking quality. Coffees that are dried too fast, uh, you can taste it in the cup. Even if you roast it really well, you'll taste like a flavors of hay or um, like almost like cereal notes. Um, coffees that are dried too long, I usually, there's, there's ferment. Um, there's usually rot or ferment. And uh, you'd be surprised how many specialty coffee companies um, sell those coffees because you know, they like the fruit, but it's actually a little bit too intense a fruit. It's actually going into ferment versus just a fruity uh, cup. Um, so the only difference really that you saw, and you, you heard him say that, you know, you agitate the water to take the mucilage off. Uh, that's truly washed. In a, in a honey process, they wouldn't do that. Um, they would just actually essentially like, you know, depulp and then right, right, to, the, right to the patio. Um, uh, yeah, and that's, that's coffee processing. Um, I can talk about at this point, um, I think we wanted to cover, I wanted to cover the idea of um, the, how does terroir or uh, variety um, affect flavor? And it, it affects it a lot. I think of, of all the things that really affect the, the fl flavor um, profile of a coffee, I would say the first one is variety is gonna be the, the main one. So things like um, Catimor is a variety, Caturra is, is very, very prominent variety in Colombia, for example. In Kenya, it's um, Bourbon, um, which is a much longer, taller, more delicate um, variety. Typically, the more delicate the variety, the harder it is to grow um, because it also yields less fruit. But in general, the rule of thumb is the less coffee a plant produces and the higher up in elevation it is, the better the, the quality of the coffee. Um, you're stressing the plant out. Um, if it's really high up, high up in the mountains, um, you do get some sun, but you also get very cold temperatures and that prolongs the maturation period of the, of the, of the fruit, which means that the carbs turn into sugars, it gets super concentrated, um, and that gives me as a roaster way more to work with in a machine. Um, if you don't have those sugars intact in, in that bean, no amount of roasting prowess is going to get you to like, you don't, sugar does, doesn't come out of nowhere. Um, it has to be there for us to manipulate, uh, just like in cooking. Um, so variety is the number one, um, I don't know what the word is, but... It, it, it's going to really give you the, the best idea of the quality of the coffee. The second would be obviously soil and soil health. Um, you know, where is it on the east side of the mountain, on the west side? How much sun are you getting? Is it an even sun? Are the, is it getting just pelted with sun all day long, um, which is going to make the fruit ripen a lot more quickly? Um, there's different varieties that give you different flavor profiles like Bourbon and Tipica are, I believe some of the oldest varieties. And those are the ones that give you, like a lot of Guatemalan coffees are Bourbons, like the majority. Um, and they give you more floral, delicate, juicy, chocolatey, really beautiful notes. And in Colombia, they've done some hybrid, um, hybrid uh, varieties, which are like Castillo in Colombia. Those are, they've been hybridized with some sort of a little bit of Robusta. And the reason for that in Colombia, they have um, the, the, the National Coffee Federation of Colombia. And, you know, it is literally the number one export. I mean, this is all they do. This is like their thing is Brazil and Colombia are like, that's, that's their thing is coffee. And when this different diseases hit the farms, they wanted to make a stronger strain of, of, of plant that can really uh, not be as susceptible to those kinds of things. And so they, the Robusta variety or Timor, which are still Robusta um, adjacent, 
they they blended them with other varieties that are better quality to make a, a more resistant plant. Uh, Castillo is one of them. Those coffees are still good and they're actually getting better. The first Castillo I ever had was maybe 10 years ago when they first started doing hybrid, hybridization for the, the rust, the leaf rust disease, uh, which really decimates farms. Uh, and it was very really vegetal. Like it was almost like, it's almost like, um, almost like a mossy sort of taste to it. It was just not, not super sweet. And 10 years later, I probably couldn't detect a Castillo from a Katura because the, the, all the technology and science that have, and, and literally nature has sort of formed this almost, it's not really a hybrid anymore. It's its own thing. Um, and the coffee tastes way better. Um, so you've got soil health. Um, you need to have the right nutrients, lots of nitrogen. Um, and also elevation is the third. So variety, soil health, uh, plant health, um, elevation is huge. Typically the higher the elevation, again, for the maturation reasons, uh, the better the coffee. The issue with climate change though, is that you typically diseases um, sort of hang out towards the bottom of the mountain, uh, mountain to the mid, but as climate change, it's getting warmer as you get up. There is a point, I, I believe it's 2,400 meters above sea level is sort of the point where coffee cannot grow anymore. There's just not enough oxygen. So as, there, as the plant is trying to get away from the heat and the, and the diseases, it's, it, they're, trying to, they're trying to climb up. But at some point, it just, you can't anymore. So um, there's a lot of uh, talk about just continuing to hybridize things and basically make new hybrids because the old varieties like the sort of standard like Bourbon and Tipica are, are very, very um, old school or like Ethiopia heirloom. Those are original, they're called land races. Um, they're, they're just, they're not gonna be able to actually keep up with climate change. And so they have to hybridize them in order to at least keep some of their qualities. Um, so in 10 years, you guys are gonna hear a very, very different list of um, varieties than I did almost 20 years ago, which is kind of wild to think about because it's happening in real time. Um, it's, re I mean, it makes me excited to see what, what the future is, but it also makes me sort of sad because um, I think you know, whenever you've, if you've, if you can watch something change that quickly, you know, there's like this nostalgia, like, oh, I remember when I used to cup like 100% Bourbon and you, you, you're not gonna be able to really do that um, in the future. Um, but the exciting thing is, is there's a lot of scientists and a lot of technology being implemented at Origin, the places where they grow coffee, uh, where they're taking that very, very seriously. Um, and they're, they're seed saving, seed banking um, in order to be able to, to, we're not gonna stop drinking coffee. So we have to figure out a way to grow it. Um, so that's those are the three main factors in flavor. And also my job, which is to, to roast it in a way that I'm not giving you just chocolate because chocolate isn't really intrinsic in coffee. That's a, that's a roast, uh, that's a roast impression is what I like to call it. That is literally roasting. You're, you're tasting what I'm doing with it. You're not, that's not inherent in the, in the bean. That's just the process. Um, kind of like, you know, caramel isn't in an onion. You caramelize it. Um, you you know you, that the sugar the sugar is from the actual process, not the not the onion. Um, and uh, I'm trying to think what else in terms of flavor. So so that leads me to flavor descriptors because we talked about wanting to to touch on that. So when I there are two sort of thoughts about this, and and I'll share my screen again because I want to show you something that's interesting, but. There's two sort of schools in terms of um, what you guys get like on a, on a bag um, that it, there's two drivers for most people when it comes to specialty coffee. When you, you approach a, a shelf of specialty coffee, the main driver is price for sure. That's the first thing people look at is price. The second thing is going to be origin. Where is it from? Do I recognize the country? Is it Colombia, Brazil? Is it Malawi? What's Ma where's Malawi? Is that a country? Um, and the third is going to be whatever the flavor notes are right? Like that drive people. And those flavor notes should reflect to some extent, maybe the, the level of roast. Um, I come across a lot of people that think that the coffee that, that I roast is too light. Um, they want, they want peats. They want start, they want super dark. They want old school La Colombe. I don't do that. Um, and that's, that's fine. And they want that, but the descriptors can be some sort of guide to that. So if you see things like dark chocolate, um, or I'm trying to think what other descriptors do, um, molasses, 
uh, like burnt toffee. Those are those are actually really um, again roast impression notes. Uh, that kind of lets you know that the coffee is a little bit dark on the darker side. If you see things like floral, bright, that's an indicator that it's it's a more it's a lighter roasted coffee. So those are sort of that's one aspect of of the importance of flavor descriptors is it sort of guides you a little bit as to the the level of roast because you can't really see the beans. The other um, is. Um, I think um, there's marketing that's involved in, in flavor descriptors. You know, you want people to buy your coffee. So it, there's, again, two schools of thought. One is the more traditional, you want to keep things familiar, you know, and know your audience. Uh, I'm not going to put on, on my coffee bags, I'm not going to put notes of a fruit that you've never heard of. Like, I'm not going to say, oh, this, this Colombian coffee tastes like Lilo or Lulo and Maracuja, because you'd be like, what are those things? That makes no sense. Um, so you want to keep them familiar, but then there's other companies that like to be exciting and and uh, and um, put descriptors that are. I think they're just they're more fun than they are descriptive. Um, it's more to like pique your interest, and um, I I tend to be on the conservative side of things when it comes to descriptors because our palates are different and. We can have preferences, but in general, people, some people can't detect certain things. Like some people like cilantro, some people hate them, hate cilantro. Some people can do mint, other people can't, you know, some people can taste things that other people cannot. So I try to, when I label my coffees, I try to do it as, as um, generally as possible <clears throat> with the understanding that I know that how you're brewing it matters. You know, if you're doing French press versus V60, that's going to change the way a coffee you're, you're going to perceive it, even tactile wise, right? French press is, is way heavier on your tongue than a V60. But also I don't want to alienate anybody. So I think if, I guess it's up to you, if you, if you're into, I was talking uh, to Chris and Zag about uh, a friend of mine that did white rabbit candy was a descriptor on a coffee once. And I just was like super furious because I thought nobody like who the, like, you know, pardon my French, but who the fuck, can, like, that's crazy. Like, that's not a good, that is, that's not what I would want to taste in my coffee. And if I didn't, what does that say about the person that's roasting it and, and presenting it? You know, I, I, I never want to make anyone feel like they're not an expert enough to buy my coffee, right? Um, I just want them to like it. And it could be, maybe they didn't taste the blood orange. That's fine. More than likely they'll taste caramel. If that's like a more familiar descriptor. Um, so the way that people pick descriptors, I think a, a lot of it has to do with marketing and, and trying to deviate to some extent from your traditional flavors. Um, I, I don't, I'm, you know, if I, if I, I try to pick descriptors that are very present, um, that are very, very obvious um, because everyone is gonna experience coffee differently depending on how they brew it. I wanted to show you really quick, um, I'm gonna share my screen again because there is the SCA, the Specialty Coffee Association. Uh, they merged a few years ago with, uh, with the European Association. So it used to be Specialty Coffee Association of America, just they merged. So now with Europe, so now it's just SCA. And they have a flavor wheel that I wanted to share with you. Um, they just redid it maybe four, gosh, maybe five years ago. So let me share my screen again so you can see it. And feel free to jump in really at any point here and um, and ask a question if you want while we're doing this. Um, so this is the flavor wheel. <clears throat> and we use this um, both for when we cup coffees to determine the quality of a coffee, give feedback to the producer, give, give feedback to the importer, but also for marketing purposes. Um, so you can see here, there's one this one is um, just for cupping. There's another wheel that's specifically for roast, uh, for roast quality purposes, excuse me. So you can see that I try to stay within that first ring is sort of the general ring, right? Like, like very, very general descriptors, very, it's very easy to understand it. And the further out you go, the more, you know, it's sort of like the center is the distilled stuff. And the stuff on the outside, the further you, are, you go in the rings, the more specific it gets. So for example, you know, if you go to the fruity, you'll see other fruits. And then you go again and you see coconut, cherry, pomegranate, pineapple, grape. 
And if you go around the wheel, um, you'll see that it towards the, if you go to the right and then down, you'll see whiny, whiskey fermented, that's alcohol fermented. Then you're getting into the defects of the coffee. Um, and then green vegetative, these right here um, might mean, these are sort of roast oriented. Um, that means that the, the coffee was actually not roasted properly. It's super, super light. And so you're not starting the caramelization process and you're getting these vegetal notes. It could also mean that the coffee was picked too early. It was too ripe in the seed. So no matter how much I roast it, um, you're gonna still get, basically you're gonna still taste the green, the green bean. If you keep going to the woody area, like the papery, musty, that is, that is a, those are defects for sure. Um, those are defects uh, in, in the, the processing, but also in storage probably. Um, but, it, but something like woody could also mean that the coffee was picked um, again too early as well. And it was dried too quickly. You go into the chemical and you get rubber, skunky, petroleum, this stuff. That is, those are definitely mostly roast related. Um, you've, you've roasted it improperly. Salty is definitely a, a, an organic defect there, but things like petroleum, skunky, rubber, you can definitely get those flavors if you, if you over roast the coffee or you roast it and almost bake it, you, you roast it too long. Um, and same thing with burnt, that's obviously um, roast related. Uh, brown spice nutty, all these things, these are pretty pleasant. Um, still, I think this area is very uh, roast driven, like molasses, dark chocolate. Here you can see this is sort of like the, these are typically found in, in medium to medium dark roasts. And then when you get over here to like the vanilla overall sweet, when you go to this side, this is the stuff from like, you know, light to medium roasted coffees really, and really light still all the way down to like lemon and lime. So you can sort of see on the left side is like, you know, the, the heavier roast on the right side is more, um, you're still preserving the intrinsic flavors of the coffee bean um, by roasting it light. But, and you can, I think you can see the S right here, the seanews.coffee, you guys, if you want to kind of spend more time with it, this is really helpful when you're tasting a coffee or cupping it. it is super helpful to see because essentially these are connected. Uh, this is done by Texas A&M, I believe, um, and another institution. They spent like four years doing this, trying every flavor. I mean, they did all kinds of incredible research to get to this wheel. But basically, like, you know, when you go to fruity, there's different kinds of fruit. There's berry fruits, citrus fruits. Um, so these, if they're in the same sort of, I don't know, I guess slice, they're all related. You know, black, all the berry flavors, raisin and prune obviously related. And then you've got these and like apple, peach, pear, stone fruits. Um, so everything's related to one another in these areas, but this is very helpful to, for taste. And again, to bring it back to what we we're talking about, taste of a coffee really, really comes down to variety, you know, soil, uh, um, like agronomy, health um, and elevation. Uh, and then obviously roasting, sure, but the, the first three are, are really what's going to really mark the, the flavor of your cup, what you're tasting. Um, I'm trying to think if for your coffee, um, let's go here, the Nicaragua El Volcan, uh, this was the ones that you got, that you got, it was a Caturra and Catuai blend, I believe. <clears throat> Catuai is a, is a hybrid. Um, for the Nicaragua, it's it's a few it's a few producers that basically come together as a community and they use the same washing station where they wash and ferment. They they bring all of their own like if they have a hundred plants and then another person has fifty, they all combine them essentially to collect. It's a collection of farms essentially, um, and that's the best way for them to 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 make their money because they they produce so little that they couldn't they couldn't do it on their own. So the El Volcan is from um, these five. Uh, I think they're all men. Yep, all men. Um, and Nicaragua is interesting because uh, it's not a super well-known coffee producing, co or so something known for their coffees. Um, but this particular, um, for me, this particular coffee was uh, super approachable. And these are the coffees, like if you see the notes on there, the almonds, chocolate, citrus. I try to keep things as simple as possible. And I do really try to refer to the flavor wheel um, for most of the coffee labels. So I'll stop sharing here. Um, so that's that's what I have. Let me. 
So I have in terms of flavor, you know, processing, roasting, what that means and buying coffee. Um, so I, I guess at this, at this time, it's what, 1240? We should, I should leave it for questions if you guys just wanna throw stuff at me. Um, we have a question. Sure. So in the beginning, when you're talking about the honey roast, are there places in Philly like that you know of that have those coffees or coffees that are from that process? Yeah, I, you know, I don't know who, you know, I, I had, unfortunately, I, I wish I would have, uh, by the time that, that I was going to send coffees to you guys, I literally sold out of the honey, like super fast. I had a hum so you guys do sell that sometimes though. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll probably, let's see. So the, the Brazil that I have now is, is essentially a pulp natural to honey, but it's not as complex as the, as the Honduras. So I would say you should be able to get, I don't know if Reanimator has, I know they've carried some yeah. honeys before, but any sort of third wave-ish um, roaster will probably have a honey. Mm -hmm. More than likely, it'll be a Costa Rica mm -hmm. uh, that they're really well known for honey processing. Um, Guatemala, not so much. It's really wet in Guatemala, so it's, it's hard to do it there. But yeah, any, if you go up to the barista and ask them, you know, do you carry honey? Pro Almost every third wave roaster that I know of has at least one honey on the menu for the year. So in terms of like seasonality, mm -hmm. really quickly, uh, coffees from mm -hmm. Colombia and all of Central America will be landing. So that means that it, they get from origin to the warehouse around April or May. So if you want really beautiful, fresh, vibrant coffees, you'll see all that stuff on the menus if they're good about their jobs. <laughs> Um, if they're good about seasonality, all these fresh like honeys, they'll all start landing in the spring, late spring. Okay. I would not purchase a honey now because that means it was harvested last year. Okay, um, that's good to know. Had it for a while. So okay. right now the fresh coffees are like Papua New Guinea, Peru, Bolivia, Malawi, Rwanda. Like I just put a Rwanda women's lot on the menu for Makina. Burundi, those are all fresh now, Peru. Mm -hmm. um, but come spring, all the Central American coffees, Colombian coffees, East African, like Ethiopia, Kenya, those are all going to be from like May through July in Honduras. That's like the peak, peak period for those coffees when they land. Okay. Um, but yeah, yeah, you should be able to find honey process coffees. Thank you. Sure. Go for it. Uh, I have quite a few questions. Uh, I just, I really like this topic and like, I love the science behind coffee. I really think dressers sure, should yeah. a coffee cl like class we should be able to take. I so, agree. I wish I had that too. This is all just experience. Yeah, we got the beer and wine tasting course, but. <laughs> exactly. You know. well, UC Davis, I think has a, a new coffee, a new coffee program. And they even bought a, a probat roaster. And a friend of mine actually is the, their, their, I guess, in-house roasting educator which is pretty amazing hopefully we can poach him uh <laughs> you talked about so uh just just the engineer in me wants to wants to know about this like solution to a, pot, a potential problem you talked about having to change elevation as a result of like climate change for a lot of these like traditional like really good uh crops that you may have to like uh, cross pollination or do whatever you can to yeah. change the strain and get it to grow higher to up to that point uh, could like, in your opinion, could like one day we have like these artificial environments that are sort of work as towers, like to actually change elevation and just like as try to reduce the amount of artificial environment as possible, but just like try to grow them at control the elevations. I, I totally think there's a, there's a person called um, Camilo Merizaldez out of Colombia. He lives in Popayan, Colombia. He, he is an ex, um, he did finance, he did some investment banking, like hedge uh, fund manager. Um, and he grows these, he has an incredible farm in Colombia. And he, I believe he's in the process of building these greenhouses to start doing what you just talked about. So maybe not elevation, I mean, he's pretty high up. He's in he's Colombia, so he's, he's got the elevation, but more he's curious about what the, the actual mass production potential is. If, if could you, I mean, kind of like pot, to be honest, you know, like if you could just make these um, artificial environments, you know, like, could we grow uh, better quality coffees without having to deal with climate change? I don't know. I think it's coffee is such a wild thing that th we're still figuring out what exactly the effects are of different things in coffee, even, even fermenting it, right? Fermentation is kind of wild. Um, so not only growing it, but also what, what you can do and they're doing a lot in, in the more 
um, resourceful or people like Camilo who has a lot of money, he's starting to ferment in steel tanks, just like they do at wineries, just like they do at breweries, you know, to, to have a more controlled environment. And even he's even starting to, um, you know, uh, do experimentations with different uh, yeast strains to see if it does anything to the, the, the coffee flavors, because not only is elevation important, but you're right, processing itself, like how cold is the water? Is it clean? How often do you wash it? Um, what kind of yeast are you putting in there? Like all those things, every fucking little thing matters in the cup. So they're just starting to do that kind of stuff. But I don't, I know that you see Santa Barbara. I think they grow coffee there in California. It's not great. It's pretty low elevation, um, but that's a, that's a super curious. They're going to have to figure it out because again, we're not going to stop drinking coffee. Um, and we sort of, we, 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 we have to progress, right? We have to figure this out. So I'd be curious too, if they could do, you know, um, basically controlled environments for coffee and maybe even do it so that you can actually produce more, like y yield more in smaller spaces. Um, because the, the other issue is that with at least in the current environment now, spacing them, uh, you have to have at least two meters of space between the plants or they're literally, they choke each other out. Like they won't produce, um, which kind of makes sense, right? Because you're, you're little, if you put them that close together, depending on how much energy they need, they're gonna start dragging energy from each other, kind of like sunflowers do, and start to choke the one on the left, that one dies because it, th this one on the right takes all the energy. So even spacing them, and the other, this is an interesting, you'll find this very interesting, but I went to Kenya, and in, in Costa Rica and Colombia, they're such a like mass production sort of um, coffee growing region that they, it's very strange. It takes about three to four years for a coffee shrub to produce fruit, fruit that you can process. So it takes a while. So that's a long time to wait, right? But in Colombia and in Costa Rica, they grow so much that they actually will cut down trees fairly young and then replant them because they just want more. Because the older the tree, the shrub is, the less fruit it produces. So they want they want to consistently keep it at like four or five years because that's the that's the peak of production. But in Kenya, which is literally considered the gold standard of coffee in terms of they do, do triple washes of their coffees, super cold water. I mean, they're, they're, they really truly make the finest coffees in the world. Their trees are like 40, 50, 60 years old. And I remember seeing a, a coffee shrub for the first time in Kenya and I was like, oh my, like the trunks were, they were trees like, and super tall where it was the fruit was, there was so much fruit on it still that it would, it would bend over. And their belief is the farmers that have been doing this, the average age of a coffee farmer in Africa is 65 years old, um, which is not good. We're trying to get more young people to produce coffee, but these trees in Kenya were like 40, 50, 60 years old, but the, 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 the fruit itself was so much more complex than like a five-year-old Colombian tree, you know? So there's two, there's two schools. One is like, let nature do its thing watch it and control it the best you can, but just, it'll figure it out. And then the other one is very much like Colombia and, and Costa Rica. They're just like, it's constant engineering, essentially. Like it's constant, like we have, we want to keep it here, but the quality and the shelf life of those coffees are very different. I can keep a Kenya on a shelf for like a year and a half and it's great. If I take a Colombian coffee, it wouldn't, I, I couldn't, I couldn't get as much out of it for as long, you know? So Anyway, and also the, they're doing a lot of work in Kenya too, though, with hybridization, because they're also facing a lot of climate change stuff. It's getting much hotter there. So they have to build res more resistant plants to the heat. There's also like a, a whole lot of different environmental conditions to also think like the yes. whole heck of a lot different. Very different, yeah. And in Ethiopia, they have, and in Ethiopia, they, it's, they're forests. They're not, in Colombia and Costa Rica, you can see, and in Brazil, you can see, like, if you take a drone, you can see it's, like, planted perfectly. It's, like, this grid. In Ethiopia, I remember the first time I went there, I was, like, where's the coffee? Like, I couldn't see it because it was literally in, in a forest. They're, like, oh, they're everywhere. And there were, there's no grid. There's no, they just kind of let them grow. You know, where the seed falls, the tree comes out. That's cool. <laughs> and then, but, but again, weirdly enough, that is also Ethiopia and Kenya, are like, the most prized coffees in the coffee world besides maybe Colombia. You know, so there's something to be said for that too. It's like, let, again, like they, they're very much into let nature do its thing. It, it knows what to do more than we do. So. I want to have that mindset. I just don't. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, so like you mentioned three to four years just to get fruits. Uh, could you give us like a, a brief timeline of how long it takes for like the coffee from planting the actual seed to mm -hmm. actually getting it in our, our cup or just even to roasting? Uh, like, I just, I think this will give us an appreciation of like how much, like the cost yeah. of coffee and like, like maybe don't have too much if you don't need it. Like, <laughs> No, keep buying more. That's what, that's sort of the, it's a, I think the issue is you're, I'll connect to what you're saying. The issue that we're having in the coffee, and, and I'm very, I'm in coffee for the producers, like truly, I love roasting, but it's really about talking to people about plants. And I'm not an agronomist or anything like that. I'm, I just think it's fascinating. Um, the problem is like what you just said, the amount of work and time that it takes, it's like a miracle that we get to drink coffee every day. It, like when you actually see what you have to do to get that bag in the warehouse, it's mind boggling. It's, a, it's like a feat of human of, of humanity kind of, but at the same time, it makes me really angry when people are like, three bucks is too much. It's like, are you kidding me? Because at the end of the day, like if you pay three bucks for your cup, I'm gonna do really rough math here. That producer probably maybe got paid 20 cents a, a pound, maybe. This is another interesting fact. Um, if you, if you, um, collect as a producer, if you collect a pound of cherry, that only gives you about a quarter pound of actual exportable coffee. You're losing like 60 to 75% once you process the whole thing. Take the cherry out, all the bad seed, all the bad coffees. So you're, it's like a constant race for them to, to catch up, right? And so in terms of the time that it takes from, you plant the, you plant the seed, you get the little, the little baby, the little baby plant, to you getting the cup, that's about at the very least really four years of work, right? But the prices that we pay don't support them doing that. So of course, the crisis that's hitting specialty coffee is young producers are like, fuck this, I'm, not, I'm going to the city. I can panhandle straight. This is like a quote, direct quote. I can panhandle in Bogota and make way more money than my parents growing coffee. So why, why would I break my back? For what? What's the point? To live out in the freaking country and like have to fight for food and like, you know, not have food on the table to produce coffee because it's like my my calling or like my family's. So so we have an issue, which is around the world why the average, but not just in Africa, but I think the average age of a producer of coffee in the world is like over 45 because young people are just not interested. They're like, the, the money isn't there. And so we as consumers and myself included, have to understand that coffee does take a lot of work um, and time. And with, like you said, with wine, we're totally fine paying for a good bottle of wine. We're even okay paying for a bottle of kombucha, paying four bucks a bottle for yeah, a bottle. Like, be, 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 be you know taking I mean? barefoot for like $20. Like what, when coffee, like might go extinct in our life that like. Yes, it's, so it's, it's a shift in, in, in really education and awareness but also like buy, buy bags of coffee. It's, it's, it is, on, to be honest, it's much cheaper to, and still more sustainable for you guys to buy whole bean coffee than it is to go to a coffee. I'm not saying don't go to a coffee shop. I, I don't, don't wanna say that, but in terms of if you're trying to save money and still drink good coffee, then the best thing you can do is buy whole bean coffee you know, and buy it at a, at a sustainable price that you know the person who's roasting it is paying above um, sea market prices and the producer is getting um, something sustainable so they can reinvest it in their farm um, and keep producing coffee and incentivize the young people to keep producing coffee. Because that, that actually is a really, really big, big problem right now for specialty coffee. The return, the amount of investment they have to make does not justify the return um, that they're getting because they're not, they're not really getting much in return because uh, people don't want to pay, you know, three bucks for a cup of coffee, you know, so I could, yeah, I could talk about this all day with you, Josh, all day. <laughs> I, I, I appreciate it though. I want, I like, you actually saw, answered another question I was going to ask, like, uh, how can we be more mindful about the economic and environmental impacts of the coffee brands we use and uh, like what we should pay attention to. But I think you gave a pretty, pretty good, pretty good descriptor. Like, uh, thanks. Yeah. Just digging, yeah. just, I would, I would just email the, like, if you're interested to see a company or see a coffee shop carrying a specific brand, Go to the website, ask questions. I'm I love getting questions from customers from all over the country, just like random stuff like how do you pay for your coffee? Or um, for the most part, third wave coffee um, companies that are small, 
the really small ones, not even Intelligentsia, the really small ones are paying for the most part. They're pro if they have good coffee, they're probably paying really good prices for it. But yeah, traceability is a, is a big deal. I have uh, so two more questions and I'm done, I promise. Uh, <laughs> how does the cost of shipping influence the cost of the actual coffee? So like I heard like this uh, big crisis in like shipping and also like the oil prices, like it takes a lot to get our coffee here and time is also a factor. Yeah, so this year was wild because of COVID too. Uh, so I'll tell you guys a little story really quick. Um, I work, um, you're recording this, so I, I shouldn't see who I work for. I have another, I have another job as a green buyer for a company um, that I've been with for six years now. I started as a consultant and I'm still working with them. But for reasons out of my control, essentially they, they, um, they left a producer sort of, to be honest, like high and dry during COVID, which is like a big no-no for me, like that you don't do that. Um, so the, the, the next coffee that you guys see on my menu, Honduras Finca Emanuel, is a direct response to um, this producer that I've known for four years. Um, he's a young man, he helps his dad run the farm. And I bought, I think he only, they only produced 20 bags of coffee, which is not a lot. It's, that's, a, that's like a micro, micro producer. But I, per, I ended up contracting all of it because I thought, you know, during COVID, it's sort of the last, it's really not the time to pull out of a contract <laughs> with somebody. Is, is you, I kind of want to take the risk. I, I can bear the risk way more than they can in Honduras. So COVID in terms of shipments, in terms of contracting, in terms of um, producers sort of being stuck with coffee was it, it was an enormous crisis this year because a lot of buyers were so freaked out by COVID that they just, they were like, I can't contract that coffee. So even if they, they bought it for four years in a row, this year they were like, we can't because we don't know what the market's gonna do. We don't know, you know, my shop might close, I, I can't buy it. So then you've got all these producers at Origin who were counting on this money because that's what they do. They have long-term contracts and all everyone pulled out and, and that now they're stuck. So shipment, shipping was not only late, but it, it was infrequent because so much less coffee was shipped out. Um, also think about the amount of time and labor it takes to produce the coffee and ship it and export it when you have COVID <laughs> and you can't have, if you have a 30 person plant, now you gotta go to 10. They still have to pump out as much volume, right? Potentially, if, 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 if people still bought it, but you have to do it with a third of your staff. Um, and in countries where healthcare isn't great and PPE is just not available, they were totally decimated. Like a, a lot of producers were, it's, I hope that they figured it out, but uh, in terms of shipments, mostly this year actually due to COVID more than oil prices was, you know, everything came here late. So if, if you're expecting a Guatemala to have arrived in April, I think we got them in like July. And that's, that's a long time for the coffee to just sit there. That's a potential loss in quality. Um, so that's a big issue. Shipping is really expensive. Even shipping to you guys, to be honest, like the, you know, the little, little boxes, I might've said this to Zach, but for me to ship as a small operator, one bag, one 12 ounce bag, it could be from here to Philly. So an hour from here, it could be from here to California. It's like between $5 and five seventy for one bag of coffee for one 12 ounce bag, which is kind of wild. So I basically split and I cook the cost into the, the retail price so that essentially the customer's paying half and I'm paying the other half. Uh, so we both don't get screwed. But in terms of even that kind of shipping, it's kind of, it's kind of insane. So, which is, it's important to, to support local stuff because if you don't, it's just, it's super expensive. Um, it's just expensive to ship in general, but I don't know if that answers your question. That was a long winded. I mean, no, I, I liked, I liked the uh, divergent to COVID and like it's, it brings up like how, like we worry about PPE and a lot of other stuff and people are just being fed up in general, but yeah. like if the livelihood of other people is like at stake and like their entire, they may exactly. lose so much more, but we can afford to, like we can afford to take a lot of these risks, but they, yes. they cannot. And it's exactly, exactly. So yeah, I mean, I've never bought for Maki and I've never bought a 20 bag lot ever. It's too, it's, it's a lot of coffee. It's 3000 pounds of coffee. Um, but I thought, you know, I can totally sell this coffee. And even if it's a little old, like I'll make the money back on it. I'm contracting it. I'm financing it. So I can, I can take the hit. They couldn't. 
And with the money that, that they got from the contract that I signed, they sent me a picture and I'll share it with Zach so he can share it with you guys. But this young guy, he's maybe 24, I think, Erlen Nolasco. He was like, I just want you to know that we were able to finish a community-based uh, coffee shop for, our, for like a little, our little neighborhood in the hills and the mountains um, because you signed the contract. Like the importer sent them the money and they were able to set up this community space um, because of that. And they were able to buy the fertilizer for the next season and they planted geisha plants. So I get first dibs on their geishas, which is a really, really fancy variety of coffee that's very expensive. Um, so I might be able to get maybe I think they planted that two years ago. So I think I'll be able to get a few bags next year. Um, but all that stuff matters. Our, our, our choices of what we purchase totally matters. You know, we'd like to think it doesn't, but it does. Thank you very much. I'm going to let yeah, someone sure. else ask a question. It, I mean, seriously, feel free to, uh, it's Gabriel at Machina Coffee. I'm happy to continue the conversation. Any other questions? Oh, wait, I see something in the chat here. You're welcome, Emma. <laughs> All right, cool, Zach, so um, take it away. Yeah, so I mean, if anyone else has any questions, feel free, I can send um, Gabe's email around to everyone or just feel free to like reach out to the coffee club and we can forward them to you and yeah. get back. Yeah, so I, I recorded this, I'll share it with everyone and other awesome. than that, everyone can feel free to go. I don't, thank you very cool. much for yeah. presenting everything, it was awesome. And it was- Thank you guys. This little series. Right. Have Thank a good you. weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Gabe. Thank you. Love the coffee. Awesome.